Again, Paul, he said there in my key verse for today with a word of encouragement, therefore the Galatian church, he said again, do not grow weary. Do not grow tired in doing good. Now, the question that would come to mind is why? Why did Paul, why did he share this word of encouragement with the Galatian church? Why did he feel the need to share this word of encouragement with the Galatian church? If you want to know the reason why, turn over to the first chapter of Galatians and take a look at what Paul said there in the sixth and the seventh verse with me. We'll see there again in the first chapter, the sixth and the seventh verse that this church was being troubled by those who perverted the gospel. The sixth and the seventh verses shows us that, that some who were of the church, they had actually turned away from Christ. They had turned to a quote unquote different gospel. See something that I want you to understand is that the early church, it was made up of both Jews and Gentiles. And so many, they were being encouraged to, to practice Judaism by those who were practicing Judaism, to live by the law, by those who were living by the law, rather than following in the way of Christ and again, living according to his way. And so if you take a look at the fourth chapter and the 17th verse, the picture is painted for us that those who are of the Galatian church, they were being courted zealously by those who were trying to persuade them away from the way of Christ. What this means, that word zealous that you'll see there, what this means is that those who were troubling them, they were doing so with great fire. They were passionate to drive the people away from Christ. And so those who were of the Galatian church, they were facing a spiritual battle. They were facing a spiritual battle that those believers who were of Judaism, they were causing them to grow weary who were trying to follow in the way of Christ. They were growing weary in their faith. They were growing weary in moving by faith. So therefore, because they were growing weary, because they were growing tired and moving by faith, they were beginning to grow weary in doing good. And again, in fact, some of them had stopped moving by faith. Some of them had stopped doing good. And so with that in mind, I would ask all of you today, I would ask all of you a question today. Is it always easy for you to move by faith? I would ask all of you the question today, is it always easy for you to do good? Now, how many of us today are facing battles? How many of us today are facing battles that that may be causing us to grow weary in our faith. Let's be honest with ourselves. How many of us today are facing battles that's causing us to grow tired in moving by faith? How many of us today are tired trying to do good in this world that we may begin to believe that we may begin to think don't deserve our good. Whoa, boy. You see, I sometimes feel like every day is a battle. I don't know about y'all, but, but I sometimes feel like every day is a battle when it comes to, to faith, moving by faith, living by faith, trying to do good in this no good world. Oh boy. I don't know if you hear me here. You see, like those are the Galatian church, our enemy, he hounds us relentlessly, doesn't he? He hounds us so that we may lose hard, so that we may grow weary in our faith, so that we may grow weary in doing good. Our enemy hounds us to make it difficult on us to live by faith. 
Not only do we face an enemy that hounds us, but we also have to deal with life itself, don't we? Living by faith in all that we go through in life, it's not an easy task, as you have heard me say time and time and time again. I don't ever try to hide that from anybody. Life is not easy. Life is filled with trials and tribulations. Life is filled with demons. Life is filled with many hardships, with many battles that we go through. We often have our struggles that can make it hard on us to live by faith, to do good, to help somebody somewhere, to help others in their struggles. I don't know if you hear me. There are times where we may desire to do the right thing, where we may desire to do good, but again, life, it makes it so that we may not have the means to be able to do so. Aside from our enemy and aside from life itself, when it comes to to doing what's right, when it comes to doing good, when it comes to living by, moving by faith, something else that makes it difficult is people. Oh, boy. We are in a world today where we try to fight for what's right. We try to fight for, for what's just. But then again, there are a whole bunch of people that's out there that love what's unjust. We try to fight for what's fair and and what's equal. And there are many who are living with us in the world today who loves inequality. Oh, boy. Those who often try to do what's right, we are often taken advantage of, aren't we? We try to do what is good and we find that our good is unappreciated, don't we? Again, making it difficult on us to do what's right and to do what's good. Being a peacemaker, doing what's right, doing what's good, it's a thankless job, isn't it? It's a thankless service, it's a thankless duty, isn't it? Doing what's right, doing what is good, it's difficult, isn't it? But the question that I would ask all of you today is, should we give up? Should we give up being a peacemaker? Should we give up doing what's right? Should we give up doing what's good all because it ain't easy? Should we give up because it's difficult? We say no, but some sadly have been defeated by the enemy. Some sadly have given up. Some sadly have lost heart living by faith, moving by faith, and doing good. Where love, compassion, honor, and respect should be in our heart, many have replaced those with weariness. We've grown weary to love our neighbor. We have grown weary in being considerate of each other. There's a danger to this, I tell you today. The danger of this is that weariness, it can quickly become apathy. A-P-A-T-H-Y, by the way. And I tell you today that an apathetic Christian is one that cannot and will not ever bear any fruit. See, weariness is what caused some of those who are of the Galatian church to turn from Christ. And I tell you today that weariness in the heart, it is still what turns many so-called believers, many professed believers, it turned them away from Christ still to this day. So we must be weary or wary of growing weary in our heart. And so for this very reason, we'll see there, looking back at my key verse there in the sixth chapter of Galatian, we'll see again that Paul, he encouraged all of God's children, every single one of us, not to grow weary in doing good. Keep on doing good is what Paul would say to you today. 
He said that in due season, if we keep on doing good, he said that we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Mm -hmm. This statement of Paul, it was one I want you to understand today. Even though he makes this statement, Paul, he did not come up with this statement by his own fruition. See, in his sermon on the mount, in Jesus, he said to the disciples, he said to them, listen to this. I believe you have heard it before. Jesus, he said, blessed are the peacemakers. Do y'all think y'all blessed today? Jesus, he said, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the sons of God. Again, I ask you today, do you believe that you are blessed? Are you on duty today as a peacemaker? To be blessed means that one has been made happy, even more, they have been made content in their heart and in their soul. So we could read that scripture whenever you come across it in the first chapter of Matthew's gospel in the ninth verse, you could read it as happy or content are the peacemakers for they shall be the sons of God. I don't know about you all, but, but for me, that makes me feel so wonderful on the inside that Jesus, he has said to me, blessed are you, you, the peacemakers. He said again there that we have been made happy, that we have been made content in our hearts because again, the sons of God, he said there, okay. We will be the sons of God, he said there. Now, the sons of God, I want you to understand today, the sons of God are all of those who are led by the Holy Spirit. I want to make that very clear here today. All of those who are the sons of God, we are, Jesus said, we are blessed. The sons of God, I want you to understand today that we are the heirs of God. And so we may begin to wonder, somebody may begin to wonder, well, what is it that we will inherit? Jesus, he declared that those who believe, those who are led by the spirit will have everlasting life. Jesus said that we will not perish. Jesus, he promised to come again. He promised to receive us unto himself so that we may be where he is. Jesus, he didn't say that he would ever leave us behind, did he? As shown in the 21st chapter of the book of Revelation and the first verse, this creation that we are a part of today, it is going away. It will pass away. And the Lord, he will bring forth a new heaven and he will bring forth a new earth that is meant for all of us who choose to continue to live by faith, all of us who choose to continue to move by faith, all of us who continue to keep on doing good, for all of us who are the peacemakers. That has been promised to us. That is a promise of hope to all of those who endure to the end. All of us who endure to the end by faith, James said that we shall receive the crown of life. And as you have heard me say before, I don't know about you, but I want to wear my crown of life. So rather than giving up on moving by faith, rather than giving up on doing good, we should be faithful to God. We should not only be faithful to God, but we should be faithful to our service to the Lord. We should not grow weary of what God has promised all of us. I hope you have not grown weary of salvation. I hope today that you have not grown weary of moving towards the kingdom of heaven. Have you gotten tired on this journey? I got some believers that have said, I ain't grown tired yet. If you haven't grown tired yet, say, Pastor, I ain't grown tired. I, I think I got some tired ones here today. That's okay if you don't grow tired. This message is for you to keep on doing good. Now, we should again not grow weary of doing good. This is the notion 
that led Paul to writing about what we should be doing in our faithful service. Paul, he said that in the first verse, he said it, that if we see someone who is overtaken in any, he said, in any trespass, Paul, he said that we have a duty to them. And, and the duty that he said that we have to them is to restore. He said we have a duty to restore them. So whether someone has sinned against God or they have sinned against us, as we saw in my sermon last Sunday, we have a duty to restore them. You see, when one repents of their sins against us, again, we should forgive them. When one sins against God, even though we don't have the power and the authority to forgive them of their sins against God, we have a duty to lead them to the Lord. You see, we should be helping others. We should be helping them to seek God's forgiveness. We have a duty to them. And just as Jesus taught Paul, he reiterates here that we have a duty to restore others in a spirit, Paul said there, of gentleness. You see, the last thing that we should be doing when someone sins against us is holding it against them if they have repented. The last thing that any of us should be doing is, is lording somebody's wrongdoings, lording it over them, holding it against them. Sin is already enough to deal with. It's such a heavy weight. It's such a heavy load. It's such a heavy burden to carry around. So the last thing that any of us should be doing is trying to keep them carrying around that burden. I don't know if you hear me. Peacemakers, we, we have a duty today. We have a duty to be compassionate to our fellow man. We have a duty today to be understanding of what somebody else is going through. See, we peacemakers, I tell you today, that we have a duty to have a sense of humility about us. We have a duty today to be patient with one another. You see, if we grow weary and we begin to lack in compassion, we begin to lack in humility, we begin to lack in patience, do you know what that means for somebody somewhere? When we start to not care about what they go through, when we start to not care about their sins against the Lord, do you know what that will do to somebody? Guess what will happen if I stop caring about you? Guess what would happen if I stopped caring about your sins against me or your sins against the Lord? You see, I don't know about how you are about when you do somebody wrong, but when I do somebody wrong, it sits with me. Again, it weighs on me. And so if I was to approach you and I was to acknowledge that I have wronged you, if you do not forgive me, that is going to weigh me down. I don't know if you hear me here today. And so again, as we saw last Sunday, we have a duty to lift that weight up off of somebody's shoulders. You see, when we start to lack in love, when we start to lack in mercy, when we start to lack in being compassionate, many souls would end up being crushed by the weight of their burdens, by the weight of their guilt, by the weight of their sin. And so we'll see it say there in the second verse, 
We'll see that Paul, he wrote to the Galatian church, to believers. He said, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. See, as we know, the law of Christ is to love the Lord, right? Mm -hmm. But the law of Christ is even more than that, isn't it? You see, the law of Christ is that we should not only love God, but that we should love each other. We are supposed to care about one another. You have heard me repeatedly say that love, it does not tear down. Love, it, it lifts up. Love, it uplifts each other. That is what we should be doing for each other. I should be helping you to flourish in the world. And you should be helping me to flourish in the world. That is what's good for us to do. We should be helping each other to prosper in life. How many of us are helping each other prosper in life today? So again, Paul, he said, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. But some of us, we will look at what's said there in the fifth verse. And in the fifth verse there, we'll see that Paul, he wrote, for each one shall bear his own load. And many of us will look at that second and we'll look at that fifth verse there and, 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 and we'll say, well, Paul just con contradicted himself. He said, hey, I'm supposed, to, I'm supposed to bear your load. But then he said that in the fifth verse, he said, man, you know, each one shall bear his own load. And so some of us will use that scripture. We'll use that scripture to say, hey, I'm only supposed to look out for myself. They will say that again. Hey, you know, Paul, he didn't really mean what he said there in the second verse because it came back in the, and he contradicted himself there. But again... The truth of the matter when it comes to dealing with burdens is that there are burdens that we will have to bear alone, that we must go to God to and for God to help us. Again, there are spiritual battles that, that we deal with that nobody else can help us with that God can help us with. While that is true, there are other burdens that you definitely better believe we can help each other with. For example, if I see you in grief, should I turn away from you? If I look at the countenance of your face and I can tell that there is something wrong with you, should I just, I ain't paying attention to him today. I ain't got time for that mess over there. I'm just gonna keep on doing. Should I not ask, hey, everything all right with your brother? Should, should I not ask, hey, is everything okay? Isn't that the right thing for us to do? You see, if you come to me for help with your struggles, what would I look like if I said, ah, you know, and I just turned and I walked away? You see, if you come to me with help for what it is that you, you are going through, I shouldn't just shrug my shoulders up and down. I shouldn't just leave that like that and pose on you and then turn and walk away from you like I just don't care. And we should help each other deal with grief. We can do that, can't we? We should help each other when it comes to dealing with anxiety. We can do that, can't we? We, we should help each other when it comes to what it is that we fear, what it is that we worry about, what it is that we may be going through physically. And like I said, I had a great help in, in my mom these past eight years when it came to what I was dealing with physically. We should help each other physically. Our mental struggles, many of us, we, we, we may be mentally weak, but many more of us, we may be mentally strong and, and we should be able to help each other with the, the psychological, with what we deal with on a mental level. We should leave others hanging with, with what they're going through mentally or, or with what they may be suffering emotionally. We should be trying to do what's right, do what's good by being there for somebody emotionally. And even 
with our spiritual afflictions. Many of us, we have had our spiritual battles that we have gone through to where, again, we can help somebody with their spiritual afflictions, with their trials and tribulations by helping them pray, praying with them, again, leading them to the Lord. I believe that we are capable of doing this, but how many of us will do this is the question today. Or how many of us have just simply grown tired and we're just not going to do it today? We are happy with being selfish rather than, you know, loving our neighbor. There's a scripture, as Jesus said, as we ought to be doing. You know, some of us, we may be thinking to ourselves right now, well, pastor, I, I, I want to do those things, but I can't. So what do we do if we can't help? Some of us, we, we may be wondering, well, pastor, if it's not possible for me to help pastor, if I can't help, am I still obligated to help? No, we may wonder about these things. These, we may have these thoughts in, in our moments where we are suffering, where again, life has taken from us to where we may not have much to give ourselves or to where we have been worn down or to where we have again grown weary. What do we do if we have grown weary in doing good? Something that we often forget is that Jesus, he also taught about self-love. In the command to love our neighbors, Jesus, he said that we are to love them as we first love ourselves, didn't he? So on that note, turn with me over to the eighth chapter of 2 Corinthians. And when you get there, take a look at the 13th and the 14th verse there. Really take a look at the 12th, the 13th and the 14th verse. We'll see there in the 13th and 14th verse that Paul, he, he wrote that again, helping each other, it should be an equal task. It's not all dependent on one to help. Paul said that when we have in abundance, we should supply those who lack. Paul, he said that when you are the one that is lacking, those that have in abundance, they should supply what you lack. I hope that makes sense. So in other words, I help you, you help me. See, the fact of the matter is that we are not going to always be able to help as we may desire to help. Because again, I'm not ignorant of life. We go through some things in life to where I may not be able to help you in this moment and you may not be able to help me in whatever moment that it is that you are going through. And so in that case, we'll see there, if we take a look at the 12th verse there, Paul, he said there, if there is first a willing mind, he said that it is accepted according to what one has and not according to what he does not have. See, if we combine that statement, if you turn over to the next chapter and you take a look at the seven verse there, if we combine that statement with the ninth chapter, the seven verse of second Corinthians, Paul, you'll see that he said, let each one gives as he purposes, as he pleases in his heart. Paul said, not grudgingly out of necessity. He said there, now, if you don't understand what that means, Paul, he is essentially telling us there that we should not feel pressured to help. We should not feel pressured to give. The pressure to give and to help when you're unable to do so, I want you to understand that that can also cause you to go weary in your soul. I again want to repeat that one more time for you. If you happen to be looking at the scripture and didn't hear what I said there, the pressure to help, 
the pressure to give when you are unable to do so that can cause you to grow weary. That can cause you to grow tired in your soul. That is unhealthy for you. That is unhealthy for your soul. So again, what, what to do there again, the key here is for us to again, have a willing mind. The key is for us to, to do good when we are able to do good. Every opportunity that we have to keep on doing good, we should keep on doing good. As Paul said there, God loves a cheerful giver. Not one that gives grudgingly. Paul said that God loves a, a cheerful giver. God, I want you to understand today, he does not want you to hate doing good. God, I want you to understand today, he does not want you to hate doing what's right. God does not want you to ever regret helping others. Do you hear me here today? You see, throughout his teachings, Jesus, he taught his followers to be sincere in their deeds. Again, turn with me today over to the sixth chapter of Matthew's gospel. Y'all know I'm a cross-referencing preacher. And there in the sixth chapter of Matthew's gospel, we're going to focus on the first through the fourth verse there. Where Jesus, he first told the disciples to take heed in doing their charitable doing their good deeds. And Jesus, he told them there in the first verse that they should not do their charitable deeds before others just for their charitable deeds to be seen by men, by people. I hope a lot of people hear that one today. Jesus, he then told them that when they did their good, they don't need to sound a trumpet. They don't need to sound a trumpet in order to be glorified by others. There in the fourth verse, we'll see that the disciples, they were encouraged to do their good deed in secret. And that the father who sees in secret, Jesus said, will reward them openly. So let's sum that up here. Jesus said that, that when you, we're still, we're his disciples, right? Jesus summed up to say here, when you do good, you don't have to, to do good for it to be seen. You don't have to shout out and let the whole world know that you're doing something good. You don't have to tell nobody, look at me. I'm doing good right now. Look at me. I'm handing out this gift basket. You don't have to do that. You don't have to call and let somebody know. Hey, look at me. I gave out a gift basket. You don't have to let nobody know that. Jesus, he said there, do it in the secret. And when you do it in secret, you will be rewarded openly by the Lord. Jesus said there. You see, the reason why Jesus had to teach the disciples this is shown to us there in that, ver in that passage of scripture there. He pointed to the hypocrites who sounded their trumpets in the synagogues and in the streets. I wonder I wonder who they, who they were. Who were these hypocrites that, that sounded the trumpets when they did their good? Now, if you're like me and if you're wondering that, you can turn over to the 23rd chapter of Matthew's gospel. Because Jesus, he made it very clear who the hypocrites were that he was referencing there in that scripture. The hypocrites, as you'll see there in the 23rd chapter of Matthew's gospel, were the religious leaders those who are supposed to be the spiritual leaders. We'll see from the fifth through the seventh verse there in the 23rd chapter of Matthew's gospel that the religious leaders, they love to be seen in doing their good. You see, Jesus, he said that they did their good deeds to, to essentially add medals and, and ribbons, if you will, to their garments, to their, to their religious robes, if you will, there. The religious leaders, Jesus, he said there, they like to be seen doing good because it helped to, to make a name for themselves. How many of us love to do good just to make a name for ourselves? Oh, boy. 
And then by that name that they had, by that title that they had, Jesus, he pointed out that the religious leaders, because they did good and it earned a name for them, they loved to go into the places and be rewarded with, with the best seats in the house. All because somebody saw them do some good. You know, there are many of us today. We like to do our good because we think that it's going to make a name for us, don't we? You see, many people today, they won't do good unless they can get something out of it. Oh, boy. Yes, there are many people today who will only do good if it adds to them, if it makes a name for them, or if they can pocket some money, if they can put some money in the bank account. Several others, they will only do good if they can post a picture of it on social media. If they can share it on Facebook. They'll let the whole world know, I did good. They didn't do good just to do good. They did it so that they can let the whole world know that they did good. Many more, they won't stop to do any good unless they will be praised. If they'll be glorified, they'll do good then. Does any of that seem like the proper mindset, the proper motivation one should have in doing what's right, in doing what's good? It doesn't sound like it to me. It doesn't sound like the proper mindset to have in doing good. It doesn't sound like the proper motivation to have when you go out and you help somebody. So what is the proper mindset? What is the proper motivation that we should have in helping someone? Should we do it just to receive a reward? Should we do it just for somebody to say, thank you? Over in Luke's gospel, the 17th chapter of Luke's gospel, the 7th through the 10th verse, that again is the 17th chapter of Luke, verse 7 through 10. Jesus, he shared the proper mindset and motivation that we should have in doing good, in being peacemakers in this world. We see that Jesus, he used a, a hypothetical to teach this very important lesson. He asked there, which of you having a servant plowing or tending sheep will say to him when he has come in from the field, when he has finished his work, come at once and sit down to eat. He then pointed out there in the A verse that when a servant finishes in the field, their master would command them to prepare and to not only prepare a meal, but to serve a meal. And after doing that, Jesus, he asked whether or not that servant would be thanked for doing what was commanded of them. Now, some of us, we would say, well, if somebody, if they tended to the field, if they tended to my flock, if they, if they cooked me a meal and if they served me a meal, some of us, you know, we would say, I would thank them. We, I would say, thank you. But for all of us who, I'm glad that you would say that, for all of us that would say that, I would tell you, well, you're thinking outside of the, hip, the, the hypothetical. You're thinking of, of your mindset. You're not putting yourself in, in the shoes of a master. You see, a master would not thank their servant for simply doing what was commanded of them. And Jesus, he said there in the ninth verse, he said, I think not. He gave an honest answer there. The master wouldn't do it. So what was the purpose of this? Why did I share this scripture with you? See, this is a hypothetical notion meant to frame the mindset that one should have in serving the Lord. See, we have received a task. And we have been tasked to minister the good news, not to some people. We have been tasked to minister the good news to all people. As we have seen, this is something that is not only done by word, it is done by deed as well. You see, I have shared with you today that we serve the Lord by loving each other. 
We serve the Lord today by being a blessing to each other. We serve the Lord today by caring about each other. We serve God today by uplifting each other, having grace for each other, being compassionate, being understanding, being considerate of each other. And so when we do these things, when we move to fulfill the task that has been assigned to us by Christ, should we expect a cookie from the Lord? Should we expect an ice cream cone from the Lord? As if we were little children and we cleaned up our room and we say, hey, mom, can I go and get a happy meal now? Is that what we should expect from God? Because we did our assignment. Even more than that, when we have helped somebody out, should we look for, for a prize from them? The one who is actually in need, should we look for them to, to reach into, the, into this and pull out something to, to put in our hand because we helped them out? Should, should we look for a prize? Should we look for a reward for them? All because we did our duty. All because we did what was right and what was good. We'll see, Jesus said there in the 10th verse that when we have done what was commanded of us, we should say we are unprofitable servants. Look at that. Jesus said that we should say that we are unprofitable servants. And even more, he said that we should say we have done what was our duty to do. This is the mindset that the peacemaker should have. This is the mindset that the child of God should have. Our mindset towards doing good must not be like the mindset of the hypocrite. It must not be like the mindset of those who have a worldly mindset. No, we should be doing good today because it is our duty to do good. It is our duty to do what is right. That is our faith. And that is why we should be doing good today. Because you said that's what you believe then. Have you confessed faith in your heart or is faith all about what comes out of your mouth? There's a difference between the professed believer and the confessed believer. That's what I said at the start of this series. Which one are you? Are you the one that's going to do good because you got your hand held out? Or are you going to do good and then you're just going to do, you know, put your hands back. Hey, you don't have to give me anything. I'm just helping you out. Which one will you be in the world today? You see, we should be doing good because we love to do good. We should be doing good because we love to help others out. We should be doing good because we love to uplift others. Now, if someone, if they reward us, that's good. That is our blessing. However, we should never expect a reward in turn for our doing what was right. We should never expect a prize in return for our labor of love. Does that turn you away from doing what's right? Does that turn you away from wanting to do what is good? And I will not hide from you today that being a peacemaker is not an easy task. It's not an easy service. Peacemakers, we are rarely going to be appreciated. We're rarely going to be thankful for our service. Peacemakers are often seen as a nuisance. We will often be seen as an annoyance. We may even upset many people Many may simply start to despise you because you are doing what is right. You are standing for what is right. We will be despised in this world. And some of us have even been killed in this world for standing in the name of what is just. However, as we have seen here today, scripture, it makes it very clear here for us that while the world may not appreciate us, our work will not go unappreciated. Your thankless service today, I tell you, will not go unappreciated. You see over in the epistle to the Hebrews in the sixth chapter in the 10th verse, the, the writer declared to us that God is not unjust to forget our work 
in our labor of love. The Lord, I want you to understand today that he is well aware of your works. I want you to understand today that God, he keeps receipts. He knows exactly what you're doing. He knows, yes, our wrongdoings, but he knows all of the good that you're putting in the world. God, he tends to his garden and he sees the good fruit that you bear. And so Jesus, he again, he made it very clear that God, he will reward us openly for our labor of love. Jesus, he again said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Great is our reward, Jesus said, in the kingdom of heaven. Why do I need the rewards? Why do I need the praise? Why do I need the glorifying of men when God is going to exalt me? When God is going to reward me? I don't need anybody else's praise. I don't need to be exalted for any good that I do in this world. Because when I leave this world, God is going to exalt me. God is going to glorify me. God is going to reward me. That is what is on my mind, moving in faith and making it to his kingdom. So I encourage you today, keep on doing good. Let us keep on doing good. Let us serve the Lord. And let us, I say to you today, let us be a blessing to somebody somewhere. Amen. 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 Thanks for watching this week's sermon. I hope that you enjoyed this week's message and I hope that you'll share it with someone somewhere. If you haven't done so already, make sure that you like this video, follow the channel as well as hit the alert bell so that you don't miss any notifications so that you don't miss any of the wonderful videos that we share here on the Newfound Faith YouTube channel.